All right, this is John Cola with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you, and I got a very special guest I want to introduce you guys to today. We got uh, Dr. Craig Summers, who's a naturopath, and he's also a nutritionist, and he's been living a plant-based diet for the last 21 years now, and he's been on a raw foods, primarily diet for the last 14, and he's a very important message for you guys that I would probably also agree with here, and the message is to share with you guys the best way to cook your food if you want to cook your food and that might even be debatable if it's even cooked so I know many of you guys are on a high carbohydrate diet whether that's a uh, you know mostly raw or partially raw you know I do a high carbohydrate raw foods diet which the carbohydrates make up the majority of the calories I eat and I recommend this for most people out there I think it's very healthy the carbohydrates that I primarily eat are fruit, but I understand that many people are not good with fruit. Maybe sometimes you can't get good quality fruit where you live. Sometimes, you know, your body doesn't handle, you know, fruit sugars all that well, especially I find as people get older, they may not be able to handle the high levels of fruit that some people in a high fruit diet do. You know, what I want to do today with you guys is actually share with you a technique that Craig's been doing for the last, I don't know, 10 years now to get more carbohydrates into him in, you know, probably the best method. So Craig, what's this method that, that you're going to share with us today? It's basically a warm your food method, but warm it for a long period of time. We're talking hours, maybe an eight hour day for a very large uh, squash, but we're cooking it or not cooking it at this temperature that's so low you can actually stick your finger in the pot and not melt your skin not you know uh, hurt yourself and not most importantly destroy the nutrients in your food or create chemicals in your food that are not healthy to be eating wow I mean that's one of the reasons why I eat to get the maximum amount of nutrients and I encourage you guys to eat a nutrient dense diet so Craig the next question I want to ask is why do this so first let me start off with the why. I do a lot of work outside. I'm very physical most of the time. And I found that I don't do well on a lot of fruits. I have like one meal of fruit, maybe three or four pieces, and then I'm good for the day as far as fruit because the sugar thing is not all that great for my particular constitution. So then if I want to get enough calories with greens, I mean you gotta eat mounds and mounds of greens to get the amount of calories that I need when I'm working outside, I'm building, I'm gardening, I'm, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. So then you look at things like nuts or avocados, which I eat avocados every day, but you know, there's only so much fat you can eat. Uh, supposedly most of us can easily digest the amount of nuts that fits in the palm of your hand. And when you go above that, your stomach is struggling to digest that amount of fat. And while that, those nuts are a good amount of calories, you know, how many can you possibly get out of, out of that amount? So I was looking for an alternative to get more calories out of my food. And then you have a, a whole range of foods like we have out here on the table that typically are not really eaten raw. Now of course there's spiralizers, spirulis, where people shred it and you can even shred it and put it on top of salads and so forth. But even then, you know, it's a lot of chewing, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of stuff so going on there. I, I want to stop you right there, Craig. So couldn't somebody like juice this or if they want to get more vegetables in them like root vegetables like beets and maybe some of the sweet potatoes that I juiced before you could juice them take away the fiber and then it'll increase the calories and also increase the absorption to yeah. get more calories in you absolutely that's one way of doing it but that's not something I've done a lot I've occasionally juiced sweet potatoes or yams but um, this one I want to cover here particularly is how to basically eat these and also you can serve them to someone who typically eats a cooked food diet and they're really not going to know the difference at all. And I, I found about 10 years ago doing this works really well for me. So this is basically the, the, the easiest way to, to do it. Very simple. First you need an electric stove. I found you can't really do this on a gas stove because that, that fire burns a little too hot. So you get your electric uh, range top and you set it on the lowest setting. You take your pot you put in some nice filtered water in there and then you take whatever uh, kind of a starchy vegetable you want to put in there I put in an acorn squash but you know we have some different types of yams here um, this is a chayote so the water sits on that very low flame 
And, and once you get the low, hang low, of it, low heat, because it's low, not a low flame. heat. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so in very low heat, and and you got to do this for a little while to get the hang of it to know just how your stove operates. And if you go to someone else's house, their stove is going to be a little bit different. But you basically you're taking the lid off and you're putting your finger in the water, and very carefully, of course. If you can put your finger in the water, you feel that water's really hot, but it's not burning you. It's not scalding you. And you really want the lid to fit good to catch all the heat. Definitely don't do this without a lid, or in this case, the lid isn't closing perfectly because the squash is a little big. So you want the lid to close tightly. And then check it about once every half an hour, once you're starting. Once you get the hang of it, you, you set it, you leave it, you come back. So I do this in the morning. And then sometime after lunch, I'll check on it. I take a fork, try to push a fork into it. Some things like smaller uh, root vegetables, they'll be ready much quicker. But then you got a big squash like this, it's going to take longer. But at, at the point where you, the fork goes right into it easily, now you have something that has been sitting in water under 118 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, you can use a thermometer if you want, but I've never used that method. I've always just used to dip your finger in it, and if your skin's still on your finger and you're not burned, <laughs> well, you know, you're not killing nutrients that way. It, you know, But it really does work great. And then you, you basically can eat it with a uh, with a spoon. Say so this um, is the same as this, right? So this one has been um, sitting around raw and it's hard. And this wow, right through it. You know, it looks just like you you boil the crap out of it as most people do. But it was at such a very low temperature that all those nutrients are intact. The amino acids haven't gone. Uh, you know what, what do they call that denatured <laughs> the, the proteins aren't denatured all the nutrients are intact and you got something that's going to give you a lot of carbs and in my instance here the reason I was doing this is because I wanted a lot of high carbs sometimes to keep up with my high active lifestyle and uh, something that wasn't going to be crazy glycemic now I'm definitely not doing this to white potatoes I don't eat white potatoes I haven't in like 20 years but I will do it with um, different types of squash and different types of yams Cool. So, uh, Craig, uh, give people out there some of the examples of the foods they could actually get and do this to, helpfully. Okay, so uh, different types of sweet potatoes uh, are, are cool. I prefer, though, yams over sweet potatoes if they're available, always. The yams are a more nutritious food than, than a sweet potato. But, of course, all different types of squash. you got a spaghetti squash here. you got a nice acorn squash here. Pretty much any type of squash. And then you got chayotes. Chayotes come in different varieties. This is your uh, your spiny variety. And this one's a little tougher. If you can get the one without the spines, it's just smooth skin on the outside. That's a lot better. Um, these are a little bit hard to work with, but typically uh, the taste of the two are the same. The different types of chayote, and that, that's the basis of what I've been doing for like the last ten years. Wow, so you're telling me, Craig, this is raw right here, so if I eat this, I can still be considered a raw foodist? You know, some people like to steam stuff, but what's what's steaming? You know, that's 212 degrees. Or some people like to blanch stuff. They boil water and they throw it in for a few seconds, pull it out. So perhaps the heat hasn't made its way all the way into the center, so the center can still be considered raw, but the outside is going to be cooked. With this method, the entire thing has been heated to a temperature that's not melting your skin, not killing your enzymes, not destroying vitamins and so forth, not denaturing protein. So technically under 118, it is raw. All right, I'm eating it. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, these are, I believe, are a wow. Japanese type of yam. Mm. These purple yams. And oh my goodness, they taste amazing. So this is something that, you know, if you're looking for some little change, something different to do, Check it out. Maybe maybe you'll like it. Maybe it's for you. So, Craig, why would it be better to you know uh, cook like these vegetables or the squashes or the yams in this way instead of like adding grains or rice or you know wheat or you know some other kind of grain or seed to your diet? Well, of course, grains have um, gluten type molecules. Gluten is really big right now. You can go in any supermarket, even in the middle of a rural part of Texas, and you'll see a gluten-free section. Pretty much everyone knows about gluten-free. So um, gliadin, which is a particular type of protein in gluten, causes allergic reactions in people. For instance, they can either have celiac, which is a very violent reaction, or you can have gluten sensitivity. But either way, what it's doing 
is it's taking those tightly packed cells, I like to look at them like, like that, that line your small intestines and creating spaces between them. So large particles that are not fully digested can go through the intestinal lining that aren't supposed to go through into your bloodstream. They get into your bloodstream and then the leukocytes or the white blood cells, which are part of the immune system, attack it. That thing starts floating around your in your um, bloodstream. It's basically called a CIC, a circulating immune complex. Now let's say you were in an accident or you just had some bad structural uh, you know, abnormality over here in your elbow and that CIC deposits in the elbow and now you have the startings of arthritis. Now, how many elderly people today have arthritis? It's, it's a huge percentage. So getting away from glutens and even if it's a gluten-free grain, they still have other types of gliadins that can potentially cause some damage in, in some people. Um, what I would re not recommend is taking these type of starchy things and boiling them because it's shown that when you boil starches you create a chemical called acrylamide and all the drinking water uh, authorities around the United States used to always monitor our drinking water very closely for acrylamide. If there was more than a few parts per million you know there would be like a big problem and now they found out that like a single slice of bread has like a huge amount of acrylamide. Starchy foods like potatoes when you cook them at high temperature a huge amount of acrylamide. So um, to my knowledge this low temperature cooking is not creating acrylamides and maybe if someone does the science and it is I'm completely convinced that it's going to be a fraction of the amount of your boiling at 212 degrees that's been known to denature proteins and so forth. So the other thing I want to mention Craig is that you're actually not taking the squash and cutting it into small pieces to create more surface area just putting it in a hole so that's going to definitely minimize the effect of the heat on the produce itself, is that correct? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, John, because you can even look this up in like Tabor's Cyclopedic Metal Dictionary in, a, in an older uh, edition, like I quote in my book, where a lot of the nutrients actually come out into the water and are discarded with the water. If you leave the skin on, you're keeping the nutrients in. It's like a barrier and it keeps the nutrients in. As soon as you cut into that and you boil it in the water, you notice the water, the color changes. Those nutrients are bleeding out, especially the vitamin C. It's bleeding out into the water and you're not maximizing on the nutrition you could be getting on it. So the bigger the uh, squash is, the bigger the pot you need. Small ones do in a small pot, but you're right. Don't cook them. I don't cut them. I never cut them. Always do them whole. Awesome. So Craig, would you also uh, you know, recommend that people maybe like cook one of these up and with their cooked or lightly, you know, um, heated um, warm, warm, warm vegetables, <laughs> right? Would you also say recommend eating like a salad with your sweet potatoes or your yams instead of just eating only yams? Yeah, well, I, I typically eat a salad before I eat anything. Like back to the work that Paul Kuchikov did with, with, um, with all that kind of stuff, they found that if you eat the raw portion of the meal first and then a cooked portion afterwards even if it's slightly warm the uh, amusant, the digestive leukocytosis leukocytosis, excuse me with uh, what Paul Kuchikoff discovered doesn't happen if you eat the raw portion of the meal first yeah I mean I would totally agree I'd always want to encourage you guys to eat you know as much raw food as you can if you need some extra calories yes I think this is probably an, one of the best methods to use uh, next, Craig, I want to talk about, you know, if somebody's already eating like a high fruit diet and they're getting a lot of carbs from the fruit, you know, why might they want to try doing it this way instead? Well, for me, um, these very high carb or high sugar fruits, they, I can feel it. Let's just leave it at that. If I eat too much of it, I can feel my blood sugar gets a little too high. My blood sugar will, will crash a little bit. Um, with this particular method, I don't feel that spike in my blood sugar and then that decline in my blood sugar. And, and sometimes people will be able to do a lot of fruit at the beginning, they'll do really good with it, but then they tend to deplete their mineral stores such as magnesium and chromium and other minerals that are needed to keep the blood sugar balanced. And after a while of doing a lots and lots of high sugar fruits, they, they start to notice the blood sugar spikes and the drops. So, for me, I tend to run uh, low on magnesium. Magnesium is a mineral that is absolutely needed 
to uh, make your insulin. It's needed for insulin receptors. And it's also the number one mineral in the human body for what they call enzymatic chain reactions, things that happen in your body to make your body function. And about 85% of the people that I've tested over the last 15 years are deficient in magnesium. You get magnesium from dark green leafy vegetables, you get it from your raw nuts and seeds, but there's also a balance that you, you want with that, a calcium to magnesium balance. And what's typically been happening is people are having way too much calcium and not enough magnesium. It gets that balance out of whack. I personally get that, and you might have some of those symptoms. You can look them up on the internet, different symptoms for different people, but you might notice like a, a muscle jumps in your eye or in your leg. And more often than not, that symptom of a muscle jumping is low magnesium. You get more magnesium into your body, those symptoms are going to go away. You get tight muscles in your neck, tight muscles in your back, wherever. Those tight muscles, usually a symptom of not enough magnesium. You sweat a lot, and you're jogging, you're sweating, you're working outside, you're sweating, you're sweating out magnesium. If you're a high stress type A person like I tend towards, you're using up a lot of magnesium. And then you don't have enough magnesium, your blood sugar is not going to kind of stay balanced when you have these high sugar fruits so much. So adding in lots of dark green leafies, those, um, those allergies or those green superfood powders, concentrated magnesium. Some people might even find they need a magnesium supplement. Um, they may not even be able to get enough that way because of that ratio, that calcium and magnesium ratio. You try incorporating more foods. Now magnesium, they also have calcium, so it, it, it may bring that magnesium level up, but the, the ratio is still yeah. not optimal. Awesome, awesome. So uh, tell me, Craig, uh, What's another benefit of, you know, uh, warming your food this way instead of, you know, boiling it or steaming it like many people may recommend? Well, uh, we covered a couple different things, such as the, the acrylamide level, um, nutrient loss maybe we haven't covered yeah. completely. The, uh, the vitamins all tend to have different temperatures at which they become deactivated. But uh, for sure, you're losing vitamins every time you heat that food. For instance, steam, if you're steaming things, 212 degrees. The longer you leave it in that, or if you're boiling, 212 degrees again. You know, you're definitely losing vitamins. Your, your proteins can become denatured. In other words, they become non-usable by the human body. So what may happen when you consume denatured protein, there has been some studies that the older we get, this denatured protein can actually build up in your body and cause a blockage of what's called cell respiration. Every cell in your body needs nutrients, amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, etc., to go through those cell membranes to get in, and needs waste products to get out. It's the same with any creature, right? Creatures eat and they poop. Your cells need to do the same thing. If you get a large buildup of denatured protein around those cells, and that those cells start to age faster. That's essentially what it shows. It speeds up the aging process in the being as well. These the nutrients aren't getting in, so the cells are getting a little malnourished. The waste products aren't getting out, so the, waste, the cells are getting a little toxic. The cells start to age faster and, and, and die faster. Awesome. So uh, this looks to me like a, you know, basically using like a crock pot or slow cooking. So Craig, is it, can you somebody buy a crock pot at their local Walmart and do the same thing? You know, I, I do believe that it's possible to do it with a crock pot. Uh, I haven't tried it myself, but I believe it'll work. I, I'm, I'm, I've tried this method on many different types of stoves, and I know that each stove varies. So you have to experiment. If you get really good at doing it at home, and then you go to someone else's house, and you try to do the same thing on their stove, you know, all of a sudden you may be at the same setting, and their stove is boiling. So there's variables there. But once you get to know your own, your own equipment, then you can do it very efficiently without having to go and stick your finger in the water every half an hour. I think part of one of the most critical things is a lot of the crock pots I've seen, they start at a minimum temperature and you just can't get the temperature low enough to maybe do this technique, especially to stick your finger in and not have it burn, your skin melt off, and do it low enough so you're just gently warming the food up and for a long period of time. So let's talk about the length of time needed to you know cook certain foods. So how about this? Acre and squash here, Craig. How long would you leave this in to get it get it completely soft and you know kind of like this one right here? Yeah. Or... So this one I'd put in right after breakfast, 
and it'd be ready for dinner. It's basically all day. Uh, these smaller ones I can put in, they'll probably be ready by lunch. Awesome, awesome. So, you know, another thing I want to mention you guys is I like gadgets and I know there are specialty appliances out there, maybe known as the sous vides. Uh, and that actually they have you could actually do it at a low temperature and actually set the digital temperature to make sure It's you know at the temperature you want and does not go above so Craig What temperature do you think this this process is done at approximately because I know you haven't ever measured it Well, I'm gonna say that it's under 118 degrees Fahrenheit because I take my finger I put it in that water I pull it out and I'm not burnt and I, I believe if you go over that temperature it's gonna burn. I've gone to hot springs many, many times. Um, there's one out in New Mexico where there's different temperature pools, and mm. they, the, the real hottest one they call the lobster pot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go in there, it's very, very hard to get in, and uh, at some point you, you need to get out and your skin's all red, and that one is maybe max 110 degrees, I, really? I think, something wow. like that. M maybe a little bit more. I, I, I don't remember, it's been years since I've been there. But I've never seen one at 118. Have you gone to Hot Springs no. 118? I don't think you can get in it. So you think this is happening below 110 degrees, the cooking? Well, the, the warming. De depending on how you do it. You know, if you're really, really concerned, get a thermometer, put it in there. I've never been that concerned. As long as it's not melting my skin, I'm not getting blisters from it, it's good for me. So. Awesome, awesome. So any last tips you want to share with people that are interested in uh, doing this method of cooking to you know, get some healthy carbohydrates into them? Well, um, the only recommendation I'll, I'll say, or I'll give is this, variety is the spice yeah. of life. If you're on a raw foods diet where you're very limited and you're having, you know, just these few foods, you know, that may not be beneficial either. You definitely want a variety of foods. When I went from eating a standard American diet, which was very limited, and I had a, just a few things I was eating, to a plant-based diet, which increase the amount of foods I was eating dramatically and then to a raw food diet and I'm still increasing the amount of foods I'm doing. I go into all different types of exotic markets. Asian markets of course and there's different type of Asian markets. Uh, here in Austin we have Korean markets, we have Chinese markets, there, there's, Vietnamese, yeah, yeah. Vietnamese Japanese, so forth yeah. and of course you have Mexican markets. Mexicans love avocados. You get uh, really good prices on avocados <laughs> here uh, being this close to Mexico and Mexican markets and they also use different types of herbs yeah. um, that you'll find in, in all these different types of markets so um, for instance that plant that's growing right right there that we talked about before um, you find that in in Mexican markets um, it's it's really amazing what you can find and, and other uh, peoples from different parts of the continents eating um, and all these uh, foods, um, or I should say most of them, you can also eat raw. So, Awesome. Yeah, I mean, just a prime example, the chayote squash here. Many of you guys probably never had chayote squash. This happens to be the spiny chayote. They also have like a green skin chayote and even a white skin chayote. And, uh, you know, I've never really eaten chayote because they're so hard. But, uh, you know, warming it in this method makes it looks like completely edible and probably super delicious. Yeah, so um, that's about all I have to share. And uh, I thank you for having me on your show. All right. Thanks, Craig. So, Craig, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, learn more about your work, you wrote a book, The Raw Foods Bible, which is an excellent book. I have a copy myself, and it's probably going to share a lot of ideas in there to help you along on your raw foods path so that you can do it successfully, like Craig's been doing successfully for the last 14 years. How can somebody uh, get a hold of you in your book? Just go to rawfoodsbible.com. Make sure you put the S in there. It's plural, F-O-O-D-S, rawfoodsbible.com. I have an email address there. You can email me. All right, Craig. Thank you. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode learning about the best cooking method to keep your foods as raw as possible while allowing you to get more healthy carbohydrates in you so that you could be as healthy and have a happy life. So uh, once again, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, until then, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're the best. John Cole with OKRod.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. What we're going to do today for you guys is actually do another compilation video. These guys, these videos are one of my uh, favorite style of videos to do. It's where I interview uh, other long-term raw 